Fine Gael We also have invited a special conference guest from the Office of Education to share God's word with us. Thank you for having us with you this morning. And just so that everybody knows, the nominating committee did uh, vote several ministry leaders, and we just wanted to do the first reading so you can go over the partial report that you can pick up outside. And um, as far as some announcements, we do have uh, the Minor Profits program going on, and it, it began last Friday at 7 p.m., and it will continue every Friday in the adult Sabbath school room. And please, next week is a wonderful week. We have Dr. Kidder. He's a special guest from Andrews University. He'll be coming for March 1st and March 2nd. He'll be talking about discipleship, and I took a class from him. He is such a godly man. He's my favorite teacher, has the best stories, because he's actually born and raised in Nineveh. Um, the first thing that he'll be talking about is experiencing God through prayer, March 1st at 7 p.m. He'll be talking about experiencing God through touching lives, March 2nd, for the uh, adult Sabbath school at 9 a.m. Experiencing God through releasing his power, that should be a good one, on Sabbath morning at 11 a.m. for the divine service. And then this is going to be, I, I invite you to come to this one. He's going to talk about his escape from Iraq on March 2nd at 2 p.m. after the potluck. And for the leaders, he's going to be teaching on how to create a culture of prayer, discipleship, and spirituality in the church. And um, the time for that will be discussed. Okay, so thank you, everybody, for coming, and enjoy the Sabbath. As your daily Bible study and prayer, singing hymns every
little barefoot boy running through the sand. What you got in that basket in your hand? There's 5,000 people waiting to be fed, thirsty for the water and the living bread. Thirsty for the water and the living bread. To sum it all up, is simply divide. Wash and fish your bread, just multiply. Add a little faith, subtract all your doubt, and watch it all work out. You got to give it away, pass it around. There's 12 four baskets sitting on the ground. I can tell by your smile and a twinkle in your eye. The master has taught you how to multiply. The master has taught you how to multiply. Little barefoot boy running through the sand. What you got in that basket in your hand? There's 5,000 people waiting to be fed. Thirsty for the water and the living bread. Thirsty for the water and the living bread. To sum it all up, you simply divide. Wash and fish your bread, just multiply. Why? Add a little faith, subtract all your doubt, and watch it all work out. You got to give it away, pass it around. The 12 four baskets sitting on the ground. I can tell by your smile and the twinkle in your eye. The master has taught you how to multiply. The master has taught you how to multiply. Man, Brixton, I had no idea. Wow, good job. It is time for the children's story. All right, kids, this money we're going to give around the church is for our school, okay? I want you to stand up if you have anything to do with the school. Your kids went to school there. You've gone to school there. You're going to school there. You're a teacher there. You are the superintendent of the schools. You are related to the school. In some way, stand up. This is our school right here, right? Okay, so kids, we're going to go around and we're going to get lots of money for this school to raise money so kids can learn about Jesus every day. Ready? Come on up. Where are you guys? Go back for seconds, you know. This is a special education day, so don't just take one, you know. Go back for more. This takes me back to my days in education. I see my friend James Woods here, and I see Amy here, and Steve Zurich. Worked with all of these people. It's wonderful. Wow. 
All right, did you guys go back for seconds? Oh, look at now, come up here. This guy has done well. Look at this, kids. Wait, wait, come here, come here. This is how you do it, so this is how you guys do it, right? That's how it's done. You guys, that's how it's done, okay? JoJo, way to go. All right. All right. Oh, good job. We'll did it too. Wait, don't give it to me. Put it in the put it in the put it in the in the box there. All right, you guys ready for a story? All right. Come on and sit down. Come on this side of the piano. Come over here. Come over here. Come over here for the story. You can sit on the front, or you can sit next to me here if you want. Sit next to me here on the front steps, wherever you like. Come over here. Sit down. Now. All right. Ready for the story? So, what is the most expensive thing you ever heard of? The most expensive thing somebody ever bought. Now, now parents are going to start to cringe here. What's the most expensive thing you ever heard? A bike. A bike. How much was the bike? Don't know. Don't know. What was the most expensive thing? Who else? What was the most expensive thing? Mini Mouse car. A what? Mini Mouse car. A Mini Mouse car. Oh, I can't even imagine how much that would cost. Oh, what's the most expensive thing you've ever heard of? Was it, was it a dollar? How much was it? May, may, it was a lot of things, actually. I heard of a lot of... How um, much was it? Like, ones were um, Lego sets that were, like, more than 100. I also heard of um, a book series that were, like, 300. No way. $300 in a $100 Lego set? What did you hear of? What was that? A Tesla Cybertruck. A Tesla Cybertruck. We've gone a little bit different than Legos here. How much was it? It was like thousands of dollars. Thousands of dollars. How much? Millions. For a, for a Tesla Cybertruck? Millions? Okay, is that the most we've heard of? Let me tell you, when I was a kid, what was, the, what was yours? Mm. What's the most expensive thing? Infinity, I guess. Ah, that's a lot. You can't beat infinity, can you? Now, okay, when I was a kid, let me tell you about the most expensive, lavish, over-the-top, ex on uh, this amount of money that was unheard of in our family. You know how much it was? It was $100. Let me tell you the story. Now, you think that's not a lot of money today, and maybe today, you know, things have changed. But when I was a boy, it was a lot of money. And let me tell you, for my parents, it was a lot of money. My dad was a missionary kid from South America, Peru, very poor. My mom was so poor when they came from Mexico as a little girl. They lived in somebody's basement. And you know what they did, her daddy? He got cereal boxes like Cheerios, and he cut the boxes open, and he made walls to keep the rats out. So my parents were very poor when they were younger. So when I was a little boy, $100 in our family was $100. It was the real deal. It meant, have you ever seen a $100 bill? Have you guys ever seen a $100 bill? You ever seen that? You have $700? What? What? Someone has $700? No way, Jose. See, have you guys seen that $100 bill? Let me tell you the story about the $100 bill for our... Let me, let, 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 okay, let me pass it around. Let me tell you the story of the $100 bill in our house. We had a family dog named Tiffany. Now... I should say, we had dogs and cats growing up. All the cats belonged to my brothers. All dogs belonged to me. So Tiffany was my dog, even though it was my mom's, and she, she's the one that named it and all that. But hey, it was my dog, Tiffany. I loved my dog, Tiffany. And one day, my parents said, OK, we're all going camping. We're going up to Mammoth, and we're going to stay in, in tents at a, some lake up there. 
uh, and, and hang out in, in Mammoth. You, I know some of you have been to Mammoth before. And when we said, yay, that's great. It's a long drive. And my parents said, okay, we're going to have to leave Tiffany at home and somebody will take care of Tiffany or we'll leave food out or whatever. Now, who did Tiffany belong to? Me. And so what did I say? No! We can't go to Mammoth without Tiffany. Tiffany has to come. And my mom and dad said, no, Marco. It's a long drive, and we're going to be staying in tents and camping out at the lake and fishing and all this stuff, and it's not the place for a dog. And I said, please, please, I can't go without my dog. Can you go without your dog? Do we go without our dog and cat? Oh, I'm not going without. He didn't go without his dog. He brought his dog with him. Look at that. And so finally my parents said, okay, 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 we'll take Tiffany with us. So we went to the lake. I think it was a Lake George. You guys, some of you guys know Mammoth, right? Lake George. And we were at the lake, and we were staying in tents, and we were fishing with our family, and those up there, and it was, we were having a good time. I didn't like fishing. I was just a little kid, but my parents liked fishing, and everybody was fishing. And so we were just the boys. We were all just playing around the lake, and Tiffany was playing around the lake. Well, we had a good time, and it was time to go home. And so we left. But when we got home, Tiffany just didn't seem herself anymore. Mm-mm. Something was wrong. She was starting to get sick, and more sick, and more sick. Finally, my parents took her to the doctor. And you know what they found out? They found inside Tiffany, do you know what they found? Not a fish. A hook. A fishing hook. There had been some bait. You know what bait is? Good smelly stuff laying on the floor. Maybe this cheesy stuff. And Tiffany had, ooh, yum, yum, um, gobbled it down and swallowed the bait and the hook, and it got stuck inside Tiffany. Well, my parents, they, come, they came and they sat me down. They said, Marco, we need to talk to you. They said, we have a problem. Tiffany swallowed a hook in Mammoth, and she's very sick. And they said, I, I know. I know. Doctors, doctors will fix her, right? And they said, um, we're going we're gonna to have to put Tiffany to sleep. And I said, well, for how long? And they said, well, for a long time. She won't wake up again. And I said, but why? If she's sleeping, she just wake up. And they said, well, we don't really mean she's sleeping. We mean the doctors are going to give her medicine so that she never wakes up again, so that she dies because she's really sick. Now, that was my dog, right? So what do you think I said? Not exactly. It was more like this. <laughs> you can't do that to my doggy. My doggy. That's Tiffany. She's my doggy. Tiffany. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. It was something like that. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I did something like that, or I just cried and cried and cried and cried. I don't know. And I said, how can you do that? And my mom said, but Marco, we can't fix her. Why can't you fix her? The doctor can fix her. And they said, we can't. And I said, why? And they said, because it costs how much? One hundred dollars. And they said, but it's a hundred dollars, Marco. And I said, oh, my doggy. And I cried and I cried. And, you know, I wasn't having a tantrum, like trying to get my way. I was crying out of sadness. This was my dog, and I couldn't stand it. And I cried and cried. And all I could remember is they said $100. And finally, eventually, after a long time of crying and all that, you know what, my dad and mom decided. They came back to me and they said, Marco, We're going to pay the price. 
we're going to pay for Tiffany to be fixed. And I felt better, but I didn't feel all the way better until the day I went to the doctor's and looked through this glass box, and I saw Tiffany wake up from surgery, and eyes, Tiffany saw me, and what do you think happened in the moment? Even though Tiffany was laying down in this box in the doctor's office behind the glass, what did Tiffany do when she saw me? We saw a tail start to wag. She couldn't get up. She was recovering from her surgery, but we saw that tail wagging, and I knew Tiffany was going to be okay. My parents paid the price. They paid $100 for Tiffany's life. You know why they did that? Who did they do that for? They did it for me. You ever thought about God in heaven? We are sinners. No matter how good we try to be, we are never, we're never good enough. We're never like Jesus. We're never perfect in our love. How many of you like done things that are wrong? Right? Everyone in here has done things that are wrong. Even when we do things that are right, we do them for the wrong reasons. Our hearts are not perfect. And we were all, we were all should be lost. We all should not get to go to heaven. None of us should deserve to go to heaven and be with Jesus forever. You know? And if we knew what that was going to be like someday for us, we would all be crying, I want to go to heaven. I want to be with Jesus. I want to be there forever. I want to go. We would all be crying if we knew what we were missing out on. And you know what the Father did? He saw the suffering. He saw our suffering. He saw our hurts. How many of you have suffered at home in your life? Sometimes we suffer. We suffer through tough, tough things. Sometimes our, our little sisters are in the hospital, right? It's tough. Sometimes terrible things happen. And Jesus, God the Father, he saw us crying and suffering here on earth and knowing we would miss out on heaven. You know what he said? He got together with Jesus, and they talked it over, and they came, and they said, we're going to pay the price. You know how much it was? What was the price? A hundred bucks. A hundred dollars. No, more than that. What was the price? Um, forgiveness. The forgiveness. But how much did forgiveness cost? Do you know? A lifetime. A lifetime? What else? Who, how much did it cost? $100. Does anyone else know what it cost? For us to be able to go to heaven, what did it cost? Jesus. Yes, it cost Jesus. But what did it cost from Jesus? What did Jesus have to give? He had to give his son. His own son. That's right, God had to give his son, his only son, to do what? To save humans. To save us. He had to give his son. That was a cost far more, far greater than $100, wasn't it? They paid the price. Jesus died on that cross for us. He paid the price for us, and his father paid the price for us, so we can be in heaven forever, forever and ever. And when we get there, as soon as we get to heaven, you know what we're going to do? We're going to wag our tails. We're so happy to be here. We're so happy to be here. Happy Sabbath, kids. Have a good Sabbath. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Good to see you all. Um, I just wanted to announce that we're going to Santa Ana uh, for our homeless ministry next week. Um, unfortunately, we had to postpone this week to next week um, uh, because of some meetings that was going on. So um, next week at 2 o'clock, we're going to leave for Santa Ana. We make the sandwiches in the morning as usual. So, And I'm excited to announce that we are going with the Spanish church again. So they're going to join us and uh, bring us their probably um, wonderful soup and, and all this stuff and the uh, hymns that they sing and everything. So we're excited about that. So if you have any uh, clothings, any jackets, any blankets, especially we, we are in need of uh, larger sizes. 
I would say medium and up uh, for clothing items, uh, pants, uh, jackets, sweaters, um, also uh, gloves and beanies if you have extra ones that you want to donate or you can just give us the uh, monetary help so that we can order all those in bulk uh, from Amazon and different places and deliver them to the homeless. I have two quick testimonies um, from the past few couple of weeks, I would say, I just wanted to share with you to show how wonderful our God is. Um, one is about uh, one, of, uh, one of our guests, one of uh, the homeless people that we normally, um, in the past two, um, two years, I would say, we've been um, helping him. He's, he was, he used to be at Doheny parking lot. And um, as you heard, he um, went into a detox center, and his, his, he has been there for a few months. And he called me um, yesterday, and uh, it was such a beautiful testimony. He said that, um, you know, he realized that all this time he was the one who was resisting God, who was resisting the Holy Spirit uh, for going to the detox center. And he said... Once, once he decided to give the control to God, that was it. He said, I am just sitting there in awe, and I'm just watching how my life is unfolding in front of me. Because he took over. He, he controlled everything. And he said, it's not that I'm not having hard times. I'm having difficult days that I feel like I just want to go and, uh, again, live, live on the beach and, and buy that bottle and go. But, but he, he stops me. He talks to me. And he stops me. And I know the Holy Spirit uh, is there every second with us. And, you know, when, when I was done talking to him, I realized, wow, your, your money and your help is really part of the cause that he's where he is right now. Because, um, you know, we always uh, serve the group on Doheny with food, with clothing, with, with love that we carried with us. And, and at some point, we, um, he, was, he ran out of, uh, his car ran out of battery. So with the money we had in the ministry, we purchased the battery for his car. And I was thinking, if he didn't have that battery in his car, he wouldn't be able to make it to Victorville to go to the detox center. So all these dots just started reconnecting for me and, and knowing how, how God is using uh, this ministry and all of you guys um, as, as his vessels, as his instruments to, to carry his will at this point. Also, another testimony was uh, from, a, uh, from a gentleman, a homeless gentleman in San Juan Capistrano in the last 10 days, as you remember, it was really rainy, and we took some uh, blankets and food to this gentleman. And um, as we started praying with him and giving him the food and the blankets, he started, he broke down, and he started crying, and he said, let me tell you a story. Last night, as it was raining and it was really cold, I was, um, I was um, sleeping on a bench at a bus stop in Mission Viejo. He even told us exactly what cross streets. And he said, I was sleeping. I was sleeping deeply on that bus stop. And for in the matter of a second, I woke up, and it was like something just threw me away from the bench. And... and not even two seconds later, there was a car that slid and, and hit that bench in that bus stop and smashed the bench. And he said, if I was sleeping on that bench, I would have been dead. I would have completely been dead. And, and the police even were shocked when they saw and they knew he always sleeps there. And he said, I'm telling you, this was the Holy Spirit. This was God who woke me up and, and th 
practically threw me off the bench to be safe. And he said, now you're bringing me food and blankets. And he said, this is just the proof to me. This is just the proof to me that God loves me no matter who I am, no matter what situation I'm in, no matter how many mistakes I've made. He loves me. And this, by, the, by this time, he was just sobbing. He was just sobbing, and it was just a proof to him. So any of the people you see on this screen, any of them, with, with, with the help we take uh, from you guys and, and whoever goes with us, uh, we, we are, we are mm -hmm. going to them from, from God. We are a vessel from him to do his will. I'm just going to end my talk uh, with a scripture that I'm going to read. It's uh, Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And our God is faithful. So please, I thank you for all you do for this ministry and all the ministries in, ch in this church. Have a blessed day. Thank you. Happy Sabbath, everyone. How do you follow up with a testimony like that, huh? So today we're here for the local offering and church budget. And the theme for today is the grateful giver. Um, I'd like to actually read a verse because what are we grateful for? What has God done for us in our lives? And, and what does he continue to do? Um, Colossians 3, 15 through 17 says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, and all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns, when spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Are you thankful for the peace that Christ gives us? Do you have that peace? For inviting us to be part of the body of the living God here on this earth. That Christ may abide and dwell in each and every one of us in our hearts and bless us abundantly. And we are blessed, right? Wait, wait, it's too quiet. We are blessed, right? Yes, we are. And that we might represent our Lord Jesus Christ well on this earth. That he gives us the ability to represent him, not only today, but every day from now and hereafter. He gives us that opportunity by abiding and dwelling in us that we can reveal him to others. Blessings abode indeed. At this time, I'd like to kneel so we can pray for the offering and for our speaker today. So all those are able, please do. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you with humble hearts. We come to the throne of grace. Lord, you give us everything we will ever need. You provide us and bless us, Lord. You have every good intention for us. Guide us in your path, Lord. As we give our tithes and offerings today, Lord, bless those that give abundantly. Bless those that give the two widow's mites. Lord, that we give from the heart, that we have a grateful heart, Lord, for what we've done. For you've done for us so much that you guide us each step of the way. Not, let our giving not be dictated by the will of our mind, but by the Holy Spirit nudging us in our hearts. That we may glorify your name, Lord, and do your good will and pleasure. Just even with the homeless ministry, Lord, the money that's given to the church budget is money that is used to serve your needs in this world and to keep everything running. Lord, 
We want to pray for Elder Steve as he presents the message today. Guide his words, anoint his lips, that he might speak your truth, and that it might be Holy Spirit guided each step of the way so each person hears what they need to hear from you, Lord. We're all different, and we all, all have that void that needs being filled by the living God. Guide his words to speak to speak to fill those voids. We pray for Mr. Woods as well, Lord, that you touch and anoint his body. Lord, that you heal him. That you correct anything that's out of line. And Lord, that you restore him, that he might use the gifts you've given him in this life to glorify your name to the fullest. Lord, we pray for those that are, have controversies, that have troubles, that are ill. Lord, this is a sinful world, and there are many things that are, are happening each step of the way that all want to take us away from you. Lord, I pray that you might smooth the trail and straighten the road. And anyone in conflict, whether it's health-wise or even spiritually, Lord, that you bring them back to the path to you. Because, Lord, we gather as a body here today and church as the body of Christ. But you want to see us gathered someday in heaven where we can see all that you've done for us and that we will not have to see as a shadow the living God as we look in a mirror dimly but see you complete and full and realize just what an awesome God you truly are. Forgive us our sins, Lord, and guide us in your truth. May the money that's given today be multiplied and, Lord, used to do your goodwill and pleasure in this earth, here and now and for many days to come. Praise and glory be to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we pray all of this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. The deacons come forward, please.
Well, good morning. It is good to be here worshiping with you on this Sabbath morning. I will tell you that I thoroughly enjoy coming to Laguna Niguel to visit your students. I thoroughly enjoy coming and visiting with Mrs. Cuevas, Mrs. Boniqua, and Ms. Gonzalez. When I generally come to the school, the students are, at least some of the students are generally outside playing, particularly the youngsters as they're learning to get along as they play. <laughs> as I go into Mrs. Maniqua's class, they are generally doing math. Isn't that right, Mark? Yeah, that's right. Um, and when I go into Mrs. Gonzalez's class, they are generally programming robots to do certain activities on their robotics board. And so I really enjoy being with you today, and I know that the Spirit will bless as we talk and we read Scripture together and we look at a very familiar story that you may look at it a little differently after we talk about it today. I invite you to open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 24. Jesus told many parables, but the three most famous parables are of the lost coin, the son, and the sheep. And in those parables, we learn that God is seeking the lost. But there is also stories in the Old Testament that also teach us the same thing. And today we're going to look at that story today, and it is found in 1 Samuel 24. Again, it is a familiar story, but perhaps you will see something a little different than what you have seen it in the past. Let's get right into it. Let's look at the first seven verses of 1 Samuel chapter 24. It says, Now it happened when Saul had returned from the following the Philistines that it was told him, saying, Take note, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and went to seek David and his men on the rocks of the wild goats. So he came to the sheepholds by the road where there was a cave, and Saul went in to attend to his needs. David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. Then the men of David said to him, This is the day of the Lord, of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as it seems good to you. And David arose and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Now it happened afterwards that David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave and went on his way. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, in just the few moments that we have together, may the Spirit guide and direct. May our ears be open to hear the teaching of this day. May the teaching be clear. We thank you for we pray this in the lovely name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, this chapter begins by telling us that Saul has just been pursuing the Philistines. And if you have read chapter 23, you know that it is a miracle that Saul was called away to follow the Philistines because he was about ready to get David. His army had surrounded David. But all of a sudden, word came of what the Philistines were doing, and so he had to leave. But we also see here in this first verse that Saul has spies everywhere because it says that it was told him where David was. 
Now, I encourage you sometime, maybe today, go to YouTube and search for Caves of Engedi. You will find that these caves are in a wilderness area far, far away, and they are very difficult to get to. Very difficult to get to. But not only that, there are these large caves where there is water, running water. And so it was a perfect place for David and his men to be hiding because it was a place of safety, but it was a place where they could get water and substance. And so Saul brings his army of 3,000 men and they are outside of this cave as Saul goes in the cave. Now you can begin to think and, and as the story tells us in the scripture that the men, David's men began to sing this is the day that the Lord has made because there is Saul. There is Saul. God has given us Saul. Get him. That's what the scripture tells us. Wait a minute, David says. And so David only cuts off a portion of his robe. But then he feels bad about it. He feels bad about it because this is the Lord's anointed. This is who God has ordained to be king. I cannot take matters into my own hands. And so in verse 7, when it says that David restrained his servants with these words, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, the Hebrew word is not translated very well in English. It says that David tore apart his men. Now, I do not think he did it physically. <laughs> he did it verbally. How dare you suggest that I lay a hand on Saul? How dare you? And so he restrained his men. Now, I find it interesting that for us in, in our human um, condition, I think I would have been with the 600 men of David saying, the, look at what the Lord, the Lord is giving Saul into your hand. Take action. But there is something about being anointed. Now, the adjective uh, for the word anointed means to be consecrated or made sacred, often involving a ceremony. And that is something that we are going to be t doing uh, a little later on uh, today. If, if it's used as a noun, the person or people chosen or declared chosen by God. Hmm. So Saul was certainly had a ceremony, and certainly he was chosen by God. I want to pause just for a moment from the story and to think about for us. I would like to suggest to you that humanity is also anointed today. Because we are anointed by the blood of Jesus. When Jesus came, he died for all. His sacrifice is for all. The most famous of these texts is John 3.16. And it's been referred to in very many different ways, even this, this afternoon, this morning. You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Because of love, God's love, he gave. We heard the story with the children's story. 
because of the parents' love for Marco, they gave Marco Tiffany, the dog. God's love gives. God the Almighty, who lovingly gives his only son to, re to redeem us, men, women, children, so that we might live forever with him. We too have been anointed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Because he has chosen us through the blood of Jesus. And so for David, he is talking about a ceremony. He is talking about God picking Saul. What I would like for us to consider and think about that each of you sitting here, your neighbors, your co-workers, all are, are anointed. The difference is believing. Believing. All right, let's get back to our story. Eight, verses 8 to 12. David also arose afterward, went out to the cave, and called out to Saul, saying, My lord, the king... And when, and when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed down. Now, I could imagine David's 600, 600 uh, men army, when Saul is leaving the cave, I could, I could kind of see them going, Whew. well, that was close. And then as Saul walks out, then they see their commander, David, doing something strange. He's walking out after them. David, what are you doing? Verse 9, and David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of men who say indeed David seeks your harm? Look this day, your eyes have seen that the Lord delivered you today into the hand in the cave and someone urged me to kill you. But my eye spared you and I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, see, yes, see, the corner of your robe in my hand, for in that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you. Now, and, and know, and see that there is neither evil nor rebellion in my hand, and I have not sinned against you, yet you hunt my life to take it. So he holds up a corner of the robe and says, see... Hey, Saul, look what I got in my hand. Oh, I got a quarter of my robe missing. See, Saul? I could have killed you, but I didn't because you were the Lord's anointed. However, I want you to understand something, and this is where we really begin to see how God's infinite love for Saul. This piece of garment represented something far different to Saul than it did to David. To David, it represented, I could have killed you. So why are you chasing me? I wish you no harm. So stop chasing me. That's what this represented to David. Now to Saul, okay, yeah, ah, but this is not the first time that Saul has seen something torn. Do you remember that story? It's found in 1 Samuel 15. When the kingdom of Israel is foretold that it's going to be torn away from Saul. The story is, is that Samuel is there with Saul. Saul has disobeyed the Lord. He was told to do something with the Amalekites and he did not do it. He did it what he wanted to do. And so what happened is... Samuel says, you have disobeyed the Lord. 
The kingdom is going to be taken from you. And Saul reaches out as Samuel is turning to go and tears the coarse portion of Samuel's robe. And he is left with the robe. And he is reminded that the kingdom is going to be given to someone else. David does not know this information. David says, this means I could have killed you. I could have hurt you. But to Saul, this means that the kingdom is torn away from me. Let's go on to verse 16. So it was when David had finished speaking these words to Saul that Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. Then he said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have rewarded me with good, whereas I rewarded you with evil. And you have shown this day how you have dealt well with me, for when the Lord delivered me into your hand, you did not kill me. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him get away safely? Therefore, may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And now I know, indeed, that you shall surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Now, how did Saul know that? There is nowhere in Samuel where it is announced that David has been anointed as king, as the next king. There is nowhere. There is nowhere where it is recorded that people knew that way back when, when David was a lad tending the sheep, that he was anointed king. It's not there. You will not find it. So the question is, how did Saul know and be able to say, now I know that you shall surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand? Two ways. The first way is found in Patriarchs and Prophets. In Patriarchs and Prophets, It says this, after evil-minded men have engaged in doing and saying wicked things against the Lord's servants, the conviction that they have been wrong sometimes takes deep hold upon their minds. That is Saul. He's been saying all kinds of things about David. However, the Spirit of the Lord strives with them. And they humble their hearts before God and before those whose influence they have sought to destroy. And they may change their course towards them. The spirit of the Lord was working on Saul's heart. So, for this piece of cloth, which to David meant, I could have killed you. And to Saul recognizes that as well. It also meant that the kingdom is going to David because the kingdom is torn away from me. The spirit of the Lord is working on the heart of Saul. Infinite love of God. God is trying to win back Saul. He's trying to convince Saul to repent of his evil ways. That is the purpose of why the Spirit has touched his heart. That is the purpose, I'm going to say, as to why this piece of cloth means something greater to Saul than it does to David. This piece of cloth represents the infinite love of God towards Saul. Saul had quite a history, actually. Um, You know, reading uh, through Samuel, um, in previous, um, he ordered the killing of 85 priests, their families, and their families in the city of Nob. 
all because the priest Elimelech helped David. Saul's not a good guy. He's not a good guy at all. I count 11 times Saul tried to kill David between 1 Samuel 18 and ending in chapter 26. Saul has a history. Saul is a despicable king. He is a king that has lost his way. He has done terrible things. And yet God is trying to win Saul back. God is demonstrating his infinite love to Saul, bestowing his spirit to win him back. God's endless love towards Saul moves Saul to a humble heart to be able to recognize that David will be king of Israel. Again, no one told Saul this. Saul's statement demonstrated God's working on his heart. You know, I don't know where, you, where you're at and in, 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 in where you're sitting today from the standpoint of what is going on in your life. I don't know about your struggles. I don't know about your past. I, I, I have no clue. But I'm here to tell you this same God who had infinite love for Saul has infinite love to you as well. There are several scriptures in the Old Testament that speak of God's endless love. Psalms 136, 26, God love endures forever. Psalms 86, 15, O Lord, you are merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. 1 Chronicles 16, 34, giving, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Lamentations 3.22, the faithful love of the Lord never ends. In scripture, this phrase, his love endures forever, can be found 26 times. And so this same God who was concerned for Saul, who had done despicable things, who was chasing David for no reason at all, is trying to win him back is the same God of today. The same God for tomorrow. God, love is infinite. You know, unfortunately, society teaches another kind of love. A love that's based on feelings and emotions. A love that does not last forever. A love that's centered in the human heart. But scripture tells us that there is a greater love than the love of human emotion. It is the love that our Father has for his children. Today, when you leave uh, this service, the deacons at the door are going to pass out a piece of cloth to each and every one of you. I hope that you will put it in your Bible. And it will be a reminder to you of God's infinite love that he has for you. Because this is what it was about for Saul. Saul. And how God was working on Saul's heart. It is a love that will never leave you or forsake you. You know, um, when I visit our, your school right here, um, I'm able to see how, how the teachers work. I'm able to um, talk with them, how they interact with kids. And um, I can tell you, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that the philosophy that motivates each of these three teachers that you have at Laguna Niguel Junior Academy 
is the things that you see up there on the screen is that it is a school that recognizes each child as precious to Jesus. I see how they talk to the kids. I see sometimes how the teacher will get down and talk. Your school is where students are treated well because they recognize that the children are a child of the king. And so that too is the philosophy that governs how their classrooms are organized. And I also want to suggest you a third thing. Is that your teachers here repre- are, know that the children are anointed by the sacrifice of Jesus. And so everything that they do in their classroom is trying to help provide a picture of a loving father, a God who has infinite love. And I just would like to thank this congregation for the support you have provided Laguna Niguel Junior Academy over the years. Our schools have been established for this very reason. To provide examples of God's infinite love that he has for the children. And so, this story of the lost king, a story of God's infinite love, is a story, unfortunately, that does not end well for Saul. But it is not because God forsook Saul. Throughout the story, throughout the story of Saul and David, you can see instances where God is intervening to provide opportunities for Saul to turn back to him. And so as Jesus told this, these parables, they all have happy endings. Unfortunately, the story of the lost king does not have a happy ending for Saul. But it is not because God is any different. God is constantly searching and looking for all who are lost. And so this morning, I would like for you to, um, as, you, as you exit today, as you get your little cloth, um, again, put it in your favorite scripture text, put it in your Bible, but may it represent the infinite love that God has for you. We will have a special music, and after the special music, we will have an anointing service, um, and, and, um, uh, and so that is how we will proceed for the rest of our church service.
Gary uh, this week, um, he had mentioned that he had spoken to uh, Mr. Woods. As some of you know, Mr. Woods has a physical ailment. It's not life-threatening, but it's, it is something that certainly deals with his bread and butter, which is his voice. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Well, as most of you may already know, Mr. James Woods is Laguna Niguel Junior Academy's music teacher, and we've been blessed to have him teach our students for the past year and a half. Unfortunately, Mr. Woods has recently been diagnosed with vocal cords, sorry, vocal nodes, and is currently unable to teach music class or direct our choirs. We've been praying for his full recovery and hope that surgery is not needed. As you can imagine, that type of surgery um, is very risky. Mr. Woods has been teaching music and directing choirs in our Adventist schools for over 40 years. He is passionate about teaching our students, and his ministry through music has made a positive impact for many students and their families and for over several generations. So we are tremendously blessed to have Mr. Woods as part of our LNJA family. I would like to invite the elders and Mr. Woods up. Uh, it'd be nice if we had a chair for Mr. Woods to be able to sit. Um, if someone could get a chair, that would be great. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, um, James speaks about anointing. And um, if you turn in your Bibles to James chapter 5, Starting with verse 13, it says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. And so sometimes when this is done, uh, some people will see that, is this the last rites? No, this is not the last rites. This is just something that scripture tells us about anointing, about calling the elders together and to pray over him and to pray something specific, and that is healing for the vocal nodes to be gone. And so... At this time, uh, uh, a couple of the elders, I think, are going to share a scripture text, and then we'll gather around him, placing our hands on him. I will place the oil on him, and the prayer will serve as an anointing prayer and also as our benediction. Today, but she wanted me to share with you a, a scripture that has meant the most to her through the years. And she said that she's leaned on it when she has gone through struggles. And it's the Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Mr. Woods, we also wanted to first about faith.
Because James says that you have faith, but you have faith when you see it in action. We've seen your faith in action for 40 years. We know that you serve God. Luke 18, verses 42 and 43, and Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight and began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave, or they gave praise to God. It's like we expect to give praise to him for healing you today. All right, if we could gather around uh, James and place your hands on him as we have our prayer. Father God in heaven, we claim this practice in James chapter 5. For your servant, James Woods, who has been a servant in not only this community, but Orange County, San Bernardino, for over 40 years, teaching beautiful music to our students teaching them about the wonderful hymns that have been given to believers throughout the ages. Father, he is currently working here, working with the children of Laguna Niguel. You have blessed him with this gift of music. You have blessed him with a voice. Father, we ask that you will Heal him. May those nodes be removed, taken away. May he return back to helping children learn more about Jesus through the music that they sing. Father, we thank you for James. We thank you for the talents that he has given to the children here. And we know because we believe, we have faith, that it will continue because you are a faithful God, an everlasting Father, and a Prince of Peace. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you all for being here and for being a part of that anointing service. Um, I know that was special, and we just want to say thank you again, Mr. Woods, for all that you've done for this community in particular. Um, and that concludes our church service for this morning. We wish you all a happy Sabbath. If you are in need of prayer, um, whether for something specific or you just would like some prayer in general, we'll have an elder up here at the front that will be available for prayer for you. Otherwise, have a happy Sabbath, a wonderful afternoon, and we hope to see you soon next week.